This is Dr. Paul Tomlinson from Compass Health Network, and I'm doing a continuing series aimed at inspiring hope and promoting wellness in these times we're living in and living through. My hope is that what I have to share, whether personal experience or applied behavioral sciences research, will somehow help in facing the challenges ahead of us with grace and humanity. This episode is a little different than any before it because it's much more personal, meaning In a two-part series, I'm going to be sharing a chronicle of my own fight against COVID-19 and trying to distill and communicate some lessons learned, both personally and from new research on the effects of the illness. In part two, I want to talk about a surprise medical twist to my story and also assess how well I did at taking my own advice and applying my own recommendations, many of which I've shared in this podcast series. In short, I hope you'll find some helpful stuff here in my hard-won experience in beating this nasty illness caused by this nasty, novel coronavirus. So here we go. Back in August, I had my annual physical, from which I learned I was basically pretty healthy, with only a couple of minor issues showing up in my blood work. I need to get that LDL down just a hair, my thyroid starting to underreact a bit as I get older, but overall very healthy, weight moving in the right direction with blood pressure under control, and no real signs of depression in the face of ongoing life stressors we're all dealing with. Then wham, exactly a week later, on my only son Aiden's 18th birthday, my partner Josie and I both tested positive for COVID-19 after getting hit in the days before like a bullet train with a series of truly awful symptoms. In my case, it started with a headache, one of those that you wake up with and it kind of ruins your whole day the kind that resides nefariously in the back of your head, causing constant distressing pain from the neck all the way up to behind the eyes, making each sideways glance a cause for wincing, the kind of headache that makes you clench your jaw to help manage the pain, the kind that seems to burrow into your facial bones and just stay there. That's the kind. I thought it might just be a stress-induced migraine, because Lord knows we all have a few things going on these days, But by evening, the other symptoms appeared with a vengeance. Crushing body aches that go right down to the bone, chills that rattle your teeth, and a fever of 102 plus. I also developed a constriction in the chest, a little bit of a dry cough, and then the well-known loss of taste and smell in the coming days. The other interesting symptom for me to try to observe in myself was a certain level of confusion, even disorientation for brief moments. I had an episode in the middle of the night where I was having great difficulty navigating in the dark out of our bedroom in order to find the bathroom. It seemed like it took me five minutes, feeling along walls, finding the TV on the wall as a landmark, figuring out which door was which. It was frightening to be so disoriented. It's difficult to describe the cognitive effects, but certainly my short-term memory was dramatically impacted which is why I took a lot of notes on my phone so that I could recount my experiences more accurately here upon recovery. And yes, I just knew somewhere inside me I would recover. Most of the time, I felt that way. I had tremendous difficulty sleeping due to the fever and body aches, which were barely touched by the extra strength Tylenol my doctor told me to take. And that was all I was told to take for pain and fever, nothing else. It wasn't enough. I just couldn't keep my fever down and Every time I looked at the thermometer, I had to use my resilience and optimism skills because it was devastating to continually see it so high and to, and to feel it throughout my being as if my blood and brain were boiling and baking. At Josie's insistence, when she would feel my skin on fire at 103 degrees or more, I'd take cold showers or baths to try to reduce my body temperature. It felt good and worked for a few minutes anyway, and then the fever was back, always, with a vengeance. It's difficult to feel anything is right with the world when you have a fever that high. Here I want to say more about my struggle with treating the symptoms of COVID, especially the fever in my case. I struggled with the notion that, of course, the fever was my body's way of eradicating the virus, cooking the Rona, as I feverishly called it one day. So maybe I needed to just gut it out and endure the fever as much as I could. Of course, many of the symptoms we chalk up to a viral infection are really just our amazing, miraculous immune systems doing their job protecting us. 
A runny nose during a cold is not a direct effect of the virus, but a result of our immune system's response to the cold virus, right? That's also true when it comes to those awful feelings of sickness that we have, that I had during this thing. The general malaise, the exhaustion, fever, and even social withdrawal are caused by activation of specialized immune cells in the brain called neuroimmune cells and their associated signals to the brain. So these changes in brain and behavior, although distressing, are highly adaptive and immensely be beneficial to us in beating illness and achieving wellness. By resting, we allow the energy-demanding immune system to do its thing. I was in bed almost 24-7 for just shy of four weeks. I didn't feel like I had a choice, though. My exhaustion was debilitating and complete. But I kept reminding myself, as did my partner, my family, my friends, that my job was to rest and recover. Period. As I mentioned, I knew my fever, which was making me near delirious and often miserable, was also making my body less hospitable to viruses, to this virus in particular, and was increasing the efficiency of my immune system. So I did my best to welcome the fever, <laughs> at the same time fighting it and trying to reduce and eliminating it. It was uh, an ambivalent time. <laughs> the mental and emo emotional reactions I had were often surprising and complex. As COVID-19 is so new, the research is scarce and constantly developing. But I went to the science to try to gauge and provide context for my own reactions to the illness. I found, not surprisingly, that mental fatigue and loss of concentration are frequently reported by people with COVID-19. Check and check. I also found some research that indicates, again not surprisingly, that people with COVID often experience anxiety about their prognosis, especially when they become aware of the extent of their physical debility. This was certainly the case with me. I had a couple of fairly intense periods of anxiety, especially as the days turned into weeks and my illness far outstripped the CDC's average of 10 to 14 days to recovery guideline. I was very worried my prognosis might worsen, that the virus might attack my lungs more vigorously, and I'd end up hospitalized on a ventilator, and that didn't sound good. I'm so grateful though my lungs stayed relatively unaffected and I maintained good oxygen saturation, 95%-ish. But the anxiety about getting worse was palpable and became fairly constant, requiring me to apply calming and deep breathing exercises that I always recommend to others. The research also shows, as did my experience, that this anxiety often remits, goes away, as COVID patients regain their strength and stamina in recovery, which I'm still doing, by the way. And my doc says I will be for weeks to come. And yes, thankfully, my anxiety has dropped like a rock as I've started to feel like myself again, and to turn my face fully to the land of the living and away from that feverish haze of illness I was in. Another relevant research finding here is that COVID patients who are separated from their families during a prolonged quarantine are at risk for depression, especially given the necessary prohibition against contact with visitors. I certainly experienced some bouts with extreme sadness, but never lapsed into depression per se. I believe this is because I'm so blessed with important protective factors that help fend off full-blown depression. What protection am I talking about? Well, you've heard me talk about it over and over, how important our personal and social connections are to our emotional and physical health. This is what got me through, first and foremost. I have a loving, caring group of, that's comprised of my partner, Josie, and my friends and my family, all who live by the credo that love is a verb. They put it into action. I couldn't be more fortunate than to have a partner who recovered from COVID, thankfully, within a week or so, who was here with me nearly 24-7 to care for me, bring me medicine and food and fluids and cool cloths for my burning forehead. I had friends who brought me home-cooked meals like cool pasta salad and jambalaya and chicken soup from one of my favorite restaurants all the way up in Kansas City, three hours from here and chilled watermelon, which turned out to be my favorite thing during this time. All of that tasted like love to me, even without my usual sense of smell and taste. I had friends, family, and work family who checked on me regularly, daily, always inquiring about how I was doing, always letting me know that I and my suffering were on their thoughtful, prayerful, watchful radar, and that they were willing to do anything I needed them to do at the drop of a hat. 
I have a best friend who's also my sister who brought care packages and who brought my beautiful grandnieces, Millie and Libby, to my living room window so I could see them smile and hear them giggle and say, I love you, Uncle Paul. Thanks for that, Lisa. I can't begin to express how important all that was to keeping me from falling over the edge into despair and how grateful I will always be to them. And they all know who they are. One last thing for now. Everybody always wants to know when they find out you've tested positive for COVID and especially when you've gotten really sick from it, where'd you get it? Short answer, we have no idea. When my partner Josie and I both got sick in August, it sort of felt like finally, after months of playing this huge worldwide game of cosmic viral tag, we were it. With that positive COVID test came the endless game of where did we get it? With the overlapping Venn diagram of each of the places we had gone in the possible 2-14 to 14 day incubation period, leading us exactly nowhere. Our contact tracing with our very helpful county health department trackers gave us no real idea. We had been careful, we had worn masks, we had not been in large groups. Basically, we had done nothing high risk during the period in question, and yet somehow we got it. I was a little surprised at my own sense of stigmatizing shame as a result of being COVID positive. The sense that we had let our guard down somehow and got tagged it, and that others would judge us and think us careless and cavalier about the virus. Not a message we want to send, and it messed with me a lot. I had to wrestle with it for a bit before I could comfortably make others aware of my condition. But I'm so glad I did, because... Only then, only that allowed the vulnerability that's required for compassion, care, and concern to flow in. And as I said, I'm convinced that's what got me through this. I have a lot more to say, including telling you about a bizarre, surprise medical twist to all this. So I'll tell you about that in part two, along with giving you my own assessment of how well I did at taking my own advice. You know how I'm always talking about how to endure hard times and difficult things in this podcast? How did I do? What worked, what really made a difference, and what didn't. It's a mixed report card, but I hope you'll find it interesting and useful.